Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Crafts and Creative Podcast. Today, my guest is Josh Spector at J Spector with an O on Twitter and the author of For the Interested Newsletter. Josh has become a, a very cool friend on Twitter. Um, he's been an incredible help to me in my book and writing it and sharing it with his audience, which has just been incredible and has given me a huge boost to my, my newsletter, to my book. It's just incredible. Today on the episode, we go deep on newsletter strategy. So if you have started a newsletter or have thought about starting a newsletter, you are going to love this episode. We start with a conversation about defining and figuring out your niche, and then we go really deep on content strategy. And my goodness, uh, we probably could have talked for three hours today and then had a follow-up podcast interview because it was just so great. And Josh really, really knows his stuff. His newsletter is currently over 18,000 readers, and he makes a pretty decent living off of that. So excited for you to check this out. Today's sponsor, as always, is me. It's Craftsman Creative. I invite you to go check out the Craftsman Creative book that has just been released. Uh, you can go to craftsmancreative.co and learn about everything that we have to offer, all to help creators like you grow your businesses and shift your mindset from creator to business owner. So on with the episode. We've got another workshop today, and I'm just inordinately excited to be joined by Josh Spector. Uh, we've been friends online, especially on Twitter, for months now, but I'm just like, we've been back and forth trying to make this happen and like to see each other on camera and to be chatting about newsletters greatly excites me. So I'm really excited to have Josh here. Josh, why don't you introduce yourself? Because I, I worry that I will skip things. I feel like you are like me. You're a multi-hyphenate. You do lots of stuff. So how do you introduce yourself to people at parties? Let's start there. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Second of all, I think this is probably the toughest question you'll ask me the, the whole the whole time trying to actually describe what I do. Um, the short version is I help creative entrepreneurs grow their audience in business. And basically I do that through sort of three different ways. Uh, one is I publish the For the Interested newsletter, uh, which I've done for about six years now. Uh, it has 18,000 subscribers. It's a free newsletter and a blend of sort of original blog posts and stuff that I write and curated stuff that I find elsewhere. Uh, the second thing I do is I'm a consultant. So I work with clients uh, to help them figure out strategies to, to grow their audience in business. Uh, and then the third thing is I have some uh, info products, courses, and a subscription product called Skill Sessions, which is a series of video workshops where I help people, uh, you know, develop specific skills to help them grow their audience in business. So, for example, the most recent one of those that I did is called the Newsletter Booster, and it's 30 ways to grow your, uh, to get more subscribers in five minutes a day. Uh, so that is at a very high level, sort of. It's all the same, it's all the same general focus, uh, but sort of delivered in different ways. Amazing. So we serve the same audience, which is exciting. Do you consider yourself more of a strategist or more of a creator, or do you kind of float the line really smoothly? How, how do you see yourself in that um, regard? I would say it's both. I would say sort of, I have this kind of uh, split business. And interestingly, like, so I, up until, so I've been full-time, uh, on my own as a sort of independent consultant creator for about six years. <clears throat> Prior to that, I had a variety of jobs in the entertainment industry and in marketing and content creation, journalism, <clears throat> a, few, a bunch of different things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I would say now, so basically the content creation, like my newsletter for the first four years that I ran it, I didn't directly monetize at all but it was the engine for all of my consulting clients. So if we were talking a couple of years ago, I would say that, you know, 90 to 95% of my revenue came through consulting and the creator side was really lead generation and audience growth, which then got me clients. <clears throat> I have since in the past couple of years, really increased my focus on the quote unquote creator side. 
so now I would say about 60, 65% of my revenue comes from consulting and 35, 40% comes from being a creator, selling <laughs> ads in my newsletter, products, subscriptions, that kind of thing. So it's really split, not quite 50, 50, but I, I would say that I'm both. Uh, and I would also add to that that I think it's, well, I'm certainly not the only one that does that or has that approach. I do think it's one of the sort of unique things about me or advantages I have on both sides. So being a creator who also is a strategist helps me be a more successful creator and being a strategist who also is a creator helps me be more effective in terms of consulting and strategy. So I see them both as sort of different, but overlapping and, and helping each other. Amazing. Uh, again, a lot of overlap and similarities there. I feel like I'm just like three or four years behind you on that same journey, right? Because I just pivoted last year into like, okay, I'm going to own this creator thing. I'm going to build my own brand. I'm going to build a following. I'm going to grow my email list. I've been writing online for over a decade, but I just never thought to turn it into a business. Mm -hmm. And then I work as a film producer and it was after the first movie that I did where I realized, oh man, as much as I love this and I've been working for over a decade to become a film producer, this isn't the actual lifestyle that I want to have working 80 hour weeks, being away from my family for six or eight weeks at a time, not seeing them, not being present. Like I have three boys and a wife and I love my family and uh, it's at odds <laughs> to yeah. do it that way. So I'm like, all right, how can I do one or two movies a year instead of needing to do five mm -hmm. in order to pay the bills and still have enough money to have the kind of lifestyle that we want to have. And that's where the creator thing came from. So very cool. I'm excited to dive in. We're going to really go deep on newsletter strategy today in this call. And I call these workshops. I know they end up as a podcast. They end up in my newsletter. They end up on YouTube. They end up as snippets on the internet. But like for those watching and listening, these really are meant to like give people something actionable that they could go and do or even pause right now and go, okay, I'm going to go do that thing that Josh just said, because that's exactly what I needed. It unlocks something. It helps them to move their business forward. And since you are, you and I both love the strategy stuff, this will be a fun conversation. So um, let's start with one of the things that I love that you do. And I know I've mentioned this many times on your tweets, but like you'll post a question or you'll post a prompt and say, throw it at me. I'm going to help you do it right now. And there are many examples. If people go through your Twitter and scroll back, they'll see where you like go 30 tweets deep on, with one person helping them figure out their question, where, wherever they're stuck. And so I'd love to start with the niche aspect or the question around um, who is your newsletter for? Because I know you're, you have an answer that you give almost daily, I bet, about your newsletter isn't narrow enough. So can you talk a little bit about your philosophy or how you coach people around identifying a group of people or identifying a niche, however you think about it? And why should people start there? Why is it so important to identify a niche that you're going to serve? Sure. So I think uh, I'm going to take this from sort of a couple different angles. So the first is sort of a general, a general statement that a, a newsletter is, at its core, a value delivery mechanism, right? So it's just a way to give value to people and get them to see it. So start with that, because I think that seems basic and obvious, but a lot of people don't approach it that way, right? They think, oh, I just want to write about what I want to write about, or maybe I'll talk about that. Like, they view it as an exercise for themselves, which, by the way, is completely fine. Like, there is value to be had and just forcing yourself to, to write or, you know, having that, right? That said, if you expect to build an audience or turn that into something, it's about the audience. It's not about you. So you need to approach it consciously and going, I'm using this to provide value to someone. And the way I would think about that is you really, this is the other place where a lot of people right off the bat get it wrong, is you want to be specific. So I say the first thing is, uh, you're going to provide specific value to a specific audience, right? Really important. You see a lot of newsletters that are very generic. And by the way, including mine, when I first started my newsletter, I think the, uh, I think the tagline was like ideas to help you become better at your work, art, and life. 
which is everything. Like it is not, that is not specific value. The only thing that was specific about it was it was people who wanted to get better, which in fairness, not everybody does. So there was a little bit of a niche there, but it's very broad, right? Um, and which is fine. Like you figure this out a lot as you go, but if you compare ideas to help you get better at your work, art and life to ideas that are to proven strategies to help creative entrepreneurs grow their audience and business way more specific. So that's ultimately where you want to head. So the question then becomes, you know, okay, so if someone buys and say, all right, I want to provide specific value to a specific audience. What is value? Right. And the way I like to, it's not the only way to define it, but I think a really helpful way to define value is to think about it in terms of transformation. Someone's at point A, they want to get to point B, your content, your newsletter is the bridge that helps them get there. If there's a transformation, it's valuable. It may be valuable without a transformation, but in most cases, it's only valuable if there's some sort of transformation, right? So that's what you want to think about, right? What is the transformation? Who are the specific people? What's the point A and point B that they want to get to? So once you have that in mind, trying, there's sort of a four questions that I recommend people think about in order to help you get there, right? The first question is, you know, if you're, a lot of people are doing a newsletter because they think they should do a newsletter or they see other people doing newsletters or whatever, right? It should, a newsletter is not a goal in itself. It's a tactic you use to achieve a goal. So start with unrelated to the newsletter. What is your overall goal? What are you trying to accomplish, right? I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z. Start there, right? Forget newsletter for a second. This is my goal. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. Then the next question is, who do you need to reach to accomplish that goal, right? I need to reach these kind of people, blah, 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 blah. I need to reach people who do this or people who have this or whatever. Then the question is, what do those people, the third question is, what do those people value, right? What's the transformation they're looking to make? Those people are at this point A, they want to get to this point B. And then the last question is, how can you provide that value to them through your newsletter? Essentially, how can you help them make that transformation? If you go through that, you sort of reverse engineer yourself into a niche. The other thing you do, and this is another huge mistake I see with a lot of newsletters, is that forces you to focus on value. You, you want to be valuable, not interesting. Lots of people are doing interesting, right? The, here's an interesting article. Here's an interesting observation about something. Here's an interesting whatever, which is fine, but it's not as valuable as value, right? And the problem with, in, and one of the ways to figure out is something interesting or valuable is I always ask myself, even on an individual piece of content level, do I want to share this article or not? I ask myself, what is my target audience going to do with this information after reading it. If there's nothing for them to do, if it's not actionable, it's probably just interesting. So I see interesting stuff all the time. If it's really interesting, I don't share it because I want people to be able to look at my newsletter, read these things, see these videos, whatever it is, and then go put them into action, right? That's way more valuable. And I think when you lose that when you start looking at other people's newsletters and ask yourself, or again, even on an individual piece of content level, is this interesting or is this valuable? You will see how many people skew to interesting and it's fine. And there will be people that, you know, will subscribe and read it, but they're not going to have the same level of depth or connection. They're not as likely to share it. They just sort of go, Oh, that was an interesting read. And you know, they move on and you really want, you're really trying to, to turn your newsletter into a must read. You're really trying to help people. And that means actionable when possible. Man, masterclass right there. So there's two things I want to double click on real quick, mm -hmm. but I feel like I just got hundreds of dollars worth of coaching from you, <laughs> which is great. Um, so valuable is harder, isn't it? Because you said there's plenty of things that you find that are interesting and you're doing the work of sifting through that and asking the question, is it valuable? Is 
is that how people really can set themselves apart is just by doing that extra step of asking themselves, is this valuable or is there something beyond that? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say it's interesting. No pun intended. Uh, I wouldn't <laughs> say that it's necessarily harder. If you're clear on what you're trying to do, it's almost impossible if you haven't decided going back to the beginning, right? If you haven't decided this is the specific value or transformation I'm trying to help this specific audience do, then it's almost impossible, right? If my newsletter was just a newsletter for creative entrepreneurs. Yeah. There's a okay, lot of great. stuff creative entrepreneurs might be interested <laughs> in, right? But by narrowing it in and defining, I'm looking to find stuff that's going to help them grow their audience and business. I basically know very quickly at a glance, if whatever this piece of content is I come across is not going to help them grow or their audience or business, it doesn't fit. Right? So I think that it's not necessarily harder as long. It's like so many things, right? The foundation makes everything easier. The problem is most people don't have that foundation. They haven't thought it through. To be honest, most, most people that are doing newsletters don't even really know why they're doing a newsletter. Um, they don't, and a lot of people don't even know what their overall goals are to begin with. So if you're, if you're doing that, then it's very hard to do anything, right? And, it's, and, and so I think that's the, you know, one of the things that I, I see and wind up talking to people a lot. And this is the other thing about niche is uh, niche is sort of mirrored by alignment. Are the things that you're doing, the things that you're sharing in alignment with the goal you ultimately want to accomplish and the people you need to reach to accomplish that? So I'll give you another example, just hypothetical, but it's like very common that I see, right? So let's say you're a website designer who builds websites for restaurant owners, right? Uh, your overall goal, forget newsletter, right? Your overall goal is you want more clients, right? That's ultimately what you want. In order to get more clients, you need restaurant owners, right? That's your target audience. But you start a newsletter all about web design because that's your expertise. So you're writing about how to build websites, and the newest, you know, WordPress plugins and all this stuff, right? And you think, I'm, you know, you're going, I'm doing all the right things, right? I'm doing the newsletter. I, this is going to lead me clients. Why am I not getting clients? But the problem is you have an alignment problem. You want restaurant owners. Restaurant owners don't give a crap about how to build websites. That's what they want to hire you for. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know about new WordPress plugins. They don't want to know any of that crap, right? So, but this, but our web designer guy is built this sort of web design newsletter. He's actually got an audience for it because other web designers are like, wow, he's sharing great stuff and I'm learning how to build better websites and this is awesome. And he's going, but I'm not getting any clients and newsletters don't work. This is what you see all the time with social media or everything else, right? They're like, oh, that doesn't work. You know, Facebook ads don't work. Twitter doesn't work, whatever. And and it's an alignment problem. The newsletter that guy should start is a newsletter about restaurant growth or restaurant marketing or something that a restaurant owner is going to see and go, that is a no brainer for me to sign up for because that's going to attract his audience. Now, when you say that to people, like in this hypothetical example, the web designer goes, all right, I get that. But like, I don't know anything about restaurant marketing. I'm a web designer. That's where curating content comes in. You don't have to just share your expertise. You can search, you can find articles. And this is what I talk about valuable, but like, it, like when you ask, is it hard? It's not hard to go find, like even if you know nothing about restaurant growth, you go to Google and you type in restaurant marketing and you, know, you find stuff that restaurant owners are gonna be interested in and curate that. This is gonna do a bunch of things, right? You name the newsletter, not the, you know, Josh, the web designer newsletter, but like restaurant marketing, you know, get more restaurant customers, whatever it is, something that restaurant owners, it's a no brainer for them to sign up for, right? And you're curating this, you're curating this content and a whole bunch of things happen. Number one, all of a sudden you're attracting 
the right audience. You can promote your services, almost treat your company or your services as like a sponsor of the newsletter, right? The other thing that happens is you're forcing yourself to learn about restaurant marketing, which when you have conversations with clients, now all of a sudden you're able to speak their language. You're not just another web designer. You're a guy who actually understands their industry by default because every week you've been finding articles to share and you've positioned yourself at the center of their industry. That's going to be super effective. And it's not any harder. You could actually argue that curating stuff is simpler than writing a newsletter to share your website expertise. But the trick is it's all at that sort of strategic foundational alignment. This is what I'm doing. And it seems obvious maybe when I say it, but I'd say like 90% of newsletters are not doing it because they just don't think about it that way. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, so good. So one or two things I want to double click on. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that has helped me a ton is exactly what you talked about with when it comes to this value, uh, thinking in terms of value and the transformation. I love that word. Um, one thing that I was told years ago, and I only applied like a year ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> was the idea of creating a, ne a niche or um, describing your audience using psychographics, not demographics. Mm -hmm. And so when you say my, uh, my newsletter is for creators, okay, but how does that define a group of people other than what they do? But when you go to psychographics, all of a sudden you can say creators who want to X. Yep. You are talking about desires, not descriptions at that point. And what this does, doing that work early on creates kind of this virtuous circle. It's really what you've described in these four questions and also the, the way you create the content. When you do that work early on, you have such an understanding that the right content that would be valuable is easier to identify because you've put constraints around it. And you kind of have created this little magnifying glass on the internet that says, oh, that's for my audience, because you already know in the back of your head, they're going to want this because it will help them get from A to B, or will help them with that transformation they care about, which when you do that and you're sharing value all the time, it actually grows that niche and grows the audience and the, the size of the, the audience, mm -hmm. because you're the one out there providing value, not just being interesting on the internet. Mm -hmm. There's so many people I've seen over the last year who created meme accounts on Twitter and grew to five, 10, 20, 30,000 followers. And I'm going, dang, I talked to them when they had 500 followers. How did they do that? And then you ask them about their business and it's struggling. Yeah. Because they're not seen as someone who can help them with the transformation. They're seen as entertainment. Mm -hmm. And okay, that may be great to have a big following on Twitter, but if it doesn't actually impact your life, um, if it doesn't grow your business, if it doesn't have you give you the ability to contribute more to grow your business, then like, what's it actually for? Um, so I probably thought about being a meme account for about four yeah. minutes and then was like, wait a minute, that's not valuable to anyone I'm seeking to serve out there. Yeah. So maybe that's a nice transition into talking about content strategy then. And we've touched on it already. Well, You've talked about real quick, curating. Real quick to, yeah, please. To the niche and the psychographic piece, because that is another thing that I think is really important that I didn't mention. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and again, like everybody struggles with niche for a variety of reasons. And I think one of the reasons is they do think about niche in terms of demographic and really all niches is, is something that connects a specific group of people. Right. So I actually, as, as you were talking, I just pulled up because it made me think about it. I had an email exchange with somebody recently and, uh, and it's exactly about what we're talking about. So I'm just going to sort of read uh, anonymously what he had said to me about his situation because he was struggling with this exact question and what I said back nice. to him, which he found helpful. So I assume other people will as well. Um, so he said, this is a guy who was in a lead generation business, like people hire him or his agency to help them get business leads. So he said, over the years, I've heard a lot about niching down and I pretty much adhered to it. But now I'm wondering, is it fine if I target small business owners? Can I keep it open? For example, the lead generation uh, configurators I sell can be used for any type of business that have pricing variations, but doesn't show pricing on their site. 
dentists, painters, attorneys, roofers, et cetera. And then the funnel design and copywriting services, I can do that for any business really. So do I really need to focus in on say concrete coders or painters uh, or can I go broader? Let me know what you think, right? Very specific area, but very common question. right? So here's what I said to him. I said, regarding niche, I think about it a little differently. People often assume niche has to do with, with a specific demographic, but it doesn't have to be that. It can also be a psychographic, what people want, or really anything else that makes it clear who your work is for. For example, one way to niche is to say you do lead generation just for painters, home improvement, et cetera. But another way to define your niche would be to say you do lead generation for businesses that earn between a certain amount and another amount of money per year. Uh, another would be to say you do lead generation for solopreneurs. Another would be to say you do lead generation for businesses who want to reach homeowners. Another would be to say you do lead generation for businesses whose current advertising dollars are not producing results and aim at repurposing those budgets. There are infinite different ways to define your niche once you go beyond thinking it has to be a specific type of business. The key is to define your niche in a way that makes you the perfect choice for someone, not just an okay choice for everyone, which, make, which winds up making you seem generic. Answering who your service is not for is as important, maybe more than who it is for. That's the, you know, that's not hard once, again, so much of this is mindset, right? Once you broaden your concept of what a niche can be, you know, he initially is coming into it going, I have to choose painters or dentists. No, you have to choose something that those painters and dentists have in common that makes you perfect for them, not for everybody. Um, so that, again, I just thought, since I literally had just uh, had that exchange, I think yesterday, I thought, I thought I'd share that. That's amazing. Well, and I wanna keep talking about this for a second now, because I what I see a lot of people, um, the way I see a lot of people react to this whole conversation around define your niche and make it a smaller niche and all this stuff is, they think that they're going to limit their possibilities or their opportunities or their growth because they're cutting off so many different people. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. I tend to say, or th at least think in that scenario is no, it, defining a niche is really, really important early on. Mm -hmm. And at some point you create a minimum viable business or a minimum viable audience out of that niche. And at that point you can, add another one, or you can expand your niche into more people to the point where you become Amazon or Apple. And I know that's a crazy stretch. I kind of sometimes hate where people go from, yeah, you're, we're talking about solopreneurs, but let's use Apple as an example. But like, let's use one product as an example. Who is the Apple watch for? It's kind of for everyone, right? But at the same time, all these different niches can see themselves as the customer of an Apple watch. Runners people with heart problems who want to be able to track things that are going on. You've got the high end model for people who want to be a fashion style icon or, at, you know, show off their status. They've figured out how to reach multiple niches instead of saying the Apple watch is out and it's for everybody. Right. I felt the same way when Apple computers started really taking over. I was in college at the time and everybody started college using PCs and everybody ended college using Macs right. <laughs> because they spoke to creatives and they spoke to college kids and their marketing was very niched around these very specific things, but they were also doing marketing that I didn't receive or see that was hitting other audiences, right? So you can do that with your business. Perfect example, getting back to like small business, the area that we're in, I run craftsmancreative.co and it started out as an online course platform for creators. And the first dozen or so courses, I had a courses on hand lettering, on photography, on makeup, on interior design, on business, on a whole suite of things, a dozen courses and about a dozen different topics. Well, who is my niche for that? Well, guess what? Every single course has its own niche. My brand is now able to reach 12 different people or 12 different groups of people with different marketing. And so I have landing pages on the site that people would never find because they're not linked anywhere. They're not in the menu. They're not part of a blog or anything like that. But I can drive ads from Facebook for people who want to learn how to create products and launch them on Kickstarter, take them to my landing page, which gives them an email sequence, which then sends them to the course to buy it, right? 
And not everybody else who's not in that niche needs to even know that's happening. So I, I don't want people to think of creating a niche or doing this work, identifying a group of people that you're seeking to serve as a limiting thing. It should just help you get off the ground faster because you're making, you're, you're creating specific value for specific people. And the more you do that, the more it's going to grow and your niche will become much broader. Now, well, here's I'm curious if you like agree with any of that or disagree with any of that, but that's been my experience. I, I agree with most of it. And the thing that I would say is the biggest reason to, and you touched on it, the biggest reason people push back against niche or get uncomfortable is because it feels very limiting. Right. And they go, but my stuff could also help this person. And that, by the way, you just thought in the email I said, right. But I can help dentists and I can help <laughs> painters and I can help yeah. construction guys and whatever. Um, and so they're very hesitant to quote unquote niche down because they don't want to rule stuff out. Right. And what I think is really helpful as a mindset with this is when you think about niche, the real question is not. What people hear, when people hear niche, they think you're saying, you're telling me that these are the only people I'm going to work with, or this is the only thing I'm going to do. The way I frame the question to them is it's not only it's ideal. Who's your mm -hmm. ideal audience to work with in terms of who you most want to work with and who you can best serve, right? Let's talk about ideal. Your messaging, your marketing, your everything should be designed to attract your ideal customers. You'll still get stuff. I still get clients that are not really in my niche, right? Like, and you can work with them or not work with them. I have people in my audience who are not, you know, my niche. I have people who read my newsletter who don't create anything. They're not entrepreneurs. They just find it interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But the whole point of niche is you're aiming for ideal, right? If you don't aim for ideal, you get whatever you get. And ultimately, you want what you want the most, right? So a great exercise for this, which is funny because it's really simple and really effective, and yet people really struggle with it at times. Like, it's, it's interesting to watch people get stumped by what is a very basic question, but it's worth, it's worth thinking through. So I'll say to people, you know, whatever it is that you do, if I could, if I could get... 500 people to be introduced to your work, your creation, your newsletter, your business, your product, your whatever it is, right? 500 people. It can't be anyone famous and it can't be anyone who knows you. Who do you want those 500 people to be? And the way you would answer that would be the people that either you most want to serve or you think would be most likely to resonate with your product, right? That is your niche, right? And you can define it however you want. It all depends on sort of what you're doing and what you're offering, right? But just, you know, so when I, when I do this with people and talk through it, sometimes if they're stumped and they're like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Or like I used to do this sometimes with comedians, let's say. Like, who do you want to be the 500 people that are going to see your show, right? And they would inevitably go, hmm. people who think I'm funny. I'm like, okay. But, <laughs> but like, let, let's, let's go a little deeper than that, right? And they might go, uh, people who like, political comedy or whatever, right? Like whatever it is, they'll say something sort of very broad at first. I go, okay, well, liberals or conservatives? Men or women? Old or young? Parents or single? Uh, college educated, not college educated. Rural, city. Uh, their view of the world is optimistic or pessimistic? There's a million questions, right? And ultimately, if you had the choice to choose those 500 people, you would not, you might instinctively if you didn't think it through, but you would not just go, oh, people who like political comedy. You'd want the people that are most likely to resonate with what you do. The answer to that question is your niche and everything you do from a sort of messaging, positioning, marketing standpoint is designed to appeal to them, your ideal audience knowing that other people are still going to filter in. But why wouldn't you tailor what you're doing to attract the people that you most want, right? It's not limiting, it's choosing, right? And I think that's the, that's the yeah. huge difference that when you think about niche in that way, I think it becomes 
less intimidating to go, oh, but I'm not, I don't want to turn away people. Like, no, it's not about that. It's about who do you want to attract? Yeah. Gosh, I love that so much. That word, that little um, uh, exercise, like I was going through it in my head as you were talking. I was like, oh, city, this, age. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's very, very helpful. So we'll make that a snippet. And by the way, sharing. you can also, you can also <laughs> apply that not only on sort of an overall level, but you can apply it on an individual, like micro content level, right? So I've written two blog posts recently. The first one was how to use a newsletter to get clients. The second one was how to use a newsletter to sell products. Those are both aimed at very... So if you were to ask me, right? If you were to ask me, who do I want to see the post about how to use a newsletter to get clients? I would not just say people who have newsletters. I would say people mm -hmm. who have newsletters and need to get clients for their service business or whatever. And then I created a separate piece of content to people that they're not looking for clients, they're looking to sell products, right? So you can even use this to both come up with content ideas and think about how you're positioning individual stuff. Gosh, that's so good. Okay, so that helps us kind of talk about content strategy. And the one thing that I wanted to make sure I got out um, that I've learned in my own life, because I've been writing online for over a decade, probably 12, 13 years at this point, and never gave myself enough time for it to turn into something meaningful. I would write a blog for six months and then I'd give up on it. Or I would start some a new website and I'd give up at, after 30 did posts or whatever. I know exactly. Right. I, I did the exact same thing. Yeah. And so the, the one piece of advice I give people when they ask about blogging or they ask about newsletter, or they, and again, I'm you know, a year in or so on this stuff, on this current iteration of my writing online. And it's like, no, I'm going to give this two, three, five, whatever amount of time, years that, it's, that it will take. I'm in it for the long haul until it works instead of, well, it didn't work in six weeks. So I guess I'm a failure and I should give up. Yeah. Um, you have to go in with this mindset of, I'm going to create value for this audience for years. Mm -hmm. And it may not work for years until at some point it actually starts working. Mm -hmm. And if you don't give yourself that time for the work to start compounding, to find the audience, to start delivering value, to like give people enough time to start with your content and then go through the transformation and then give you testimonials and feedback like, hey, I did what you said and it worked. I've been following your stuff for a year. If you only write for six months, you're not even giving people an opportunity to go through the transformation. So I'm curious your take on this, but also like what you were just talking about, blog, newsletter, how they are interconnected, how they both serve the same audience. You know, you came on a, a spaces with um, Dylan and I just a few weeks ago and talked a lot about this, but if there was anything else you'd like to say, um, now's the time as well, but I'm curious how you think about content and how you coach people when it comes to, you know, the people that are coming to you and saying, I want to start a newsletter. I want it to be successful. I want to grow it to 10,000 people. What are some of the content strategy advice pieces that you give them? So I think, well, so to your point, consistency in a long game is really important, right? Especially when it comes to newsletters, like newsletters don't go viral. Right. First of all, viral is overrated anyway, but like, let's just start with that. Right. So like, I don't care how great your newsletter is, you know, you're not like a rocket ship going from zero to a million subscribers in a month. Like that's not happening. Right. So it, you know, you have to be patient. One of the things that I think is really helpful, and I've written a blog post about this, uh, called like the 100 times method or the 100 X method. Um, 100 is just a make-believe number. It doesn't have to be 100. So don't people get bogged down in that. But the idea is this, that when you start something, whether it's a newsletter, a podcast, a blog, whatever it is, you pick a, you're going to set an output goal, not an outcome goal, right? Most people are hung up on looking at the outcome, totally out of, out of your control, no matter how great you do it. Output is 100% in your control. So you might say, let's just take a newsletter, for example, right? You might say, I'm going to publish an issue every week for six months. That's my goal. If I do that, which is 100% in my control, I'm successful. 
no matter how many subscribers I get, no matter how many I don't. At the end of six months, then I'm going to look at it and go, is this working? Is this not working? Do I want to continue this? Do I want to switch it up? At that point, you're going to make that judgment. When you do, and until that point, I don't care. I'm not thinking about stopping. I don't care how many subscribers I'm getting or not getting. I committed to six months or whatever number you choose up front. When you do that, all sorts of good things happen, right? Number one, most people, when they don't do that, from day one, they're trying to figure out whether or not they should quit, right? From day one, they're like, I don't know if this is working or not. Uh, should I quit? Should I give up? Should I whatever, right? So you remove all of that by going, I'm doing this for six months and then I'm going to decide, right? You don't have to have that sort of constant, is this working or not? Should I quit or not? The second thing it does is if you actually should quit or it's not working or you don't really want to do it, it allows you to walk away without feeling like a failure. Because the other thing is, one of the problems is people quit too soon. Another problem is people quit too late because they don't want to sort of give up. So the part where you're like, oh, you know, give yourself two years, five years, I agree with it in theory, but I think it's dangerous to not create a moment where you can decide, you know what, maybe my time is better spent doing something else. If you, if you commit to that set time frame up front, right? Like let's say six months, at the end of six months, it allows you to really assess it and it allows you to walk away feeling actually like, a success. I said I was going to try it for six months. I did it for six months. I can now walk away without feeling like a quitter, a failure, or whatever. Right. So I think it does a lot of good stuff. And you can also decide to continue. And if you decide to continue, do it again. I'm going to commit to another six months, or I'm going to commit to another year, or I'm going to commit to three months, or whatever it is. Um, the other thing I would say, and I explain all this in that article, is you know, I'd use 100 as like commit to doing something 100 times, whatever, right? But to give you an example, you can not only set whatever time frame or commitment level you want, you can frame the commitment however you want. So it might not be, I'm going to publish an issue for six months. It might be, I'm going to spend an hour a day on my newsletter for six months, right? Or it might be, I'm going to write, like, let's say you're writing a book or whatever, you know, I'm going to write a page of my novel a day for a hundred days or, you know, whatever it is. Right. So you can tie it to any sort of output goal. What you don't want to do is I'm going to do this. And if I don't have a thousand subscribers in six months, I'm going to shut it down. I think that it's a mistake to tie it to outcome because you're never going to control that. But the output you can control and I think you can, you know, so I'm getting ready to launch a podcast and I'm going to commit to 12 episodes. You know, I'm going to do an episode a week for three months and then we'll see. Right. Um, yeah. You know, people ask me, like, That's I exciting. publish my newsletter. <laughs> uh, and at this point, my newsletter, you know, has become the engine of everything. So it's not that hard for me to sort of keep doing it. I'm out of that. Should I continue or not mode? Um, but people will ask me, like, how do you, you know, I think this week is like the 312th issue in a row. Um, and that's not counting the dailies that I now do. But people will ask me, like, how do you do that? And I go, I don't. I publish one in a row 300 times, right? Like, I didn't set out to be like, oh, I'm going to do 300. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm just sort of in the moment. But I think once you get to a certain point, it's easier to do that. In the beginning, I think it's helpful. I'm no longer at a stage where I'm like, is this working or not? Right. So I don't have right. to worry about that. But I think in the beginning, it's really important to sort of remove that because you'll drive yourself crazy thinking about whether or not it's working. Yeah. I want to share my personal experience going through this exact thing over the last eight months mm -hmm. because I wrote a book last fall and it had I said, I want to write a book and make $10,000 or I want to write a book and get 10,000 subscribers or whatever vanity metric that I was trying to search for. Well, I would have failed on both of those fronts and I would have been disappointed. But when, like you said, when you set an output goal, not an outcome goal, you set the terms of what qualifies as success or 
what allows you to feel good about yourself or happy about the process. So all I decided to do was show up every day. And at some point, a book will emerge from writing every day. And at some point, a few months after that, it'll be published. And my hope is that people will find it and discover it and share it and benefit from it. But that wasn't a goal. That was just, that'd be nice if that happens. Well, what happens when you focus on output, not outcome, is that you're actually really grateful for everything that happens along the way. So there were multiple times where you shared one of my posts, which was a chapter of my my uh, my book. Justin Moore shared it. Justin Sass shared it. Um, like, oh, Justin Sass, Justin Welsh. Yeah, um, Justin. You know, I, a lot of Justins. Yeah. I think that's the most creative name. It's either Justin, Ryan, or Scott, one of those three. I was just going through a list of people, and I was just like, wow, there's a lot of those. But, like, the fact that they – that you and they did that unprovoked um, was a good signal for me that I was on the right track and that it was working. But the amount of like overwhelming excitement and joy that I got from like showing up in your newsletter or having Justin talk about it in his um, or someone retweeting it, Arvid Call retweeting my stuff, you know, people with 40, 50, 100,000 followers sharing my stuff without me asking them or paying them to do so is like incredible. But I can. I can directly speak to other times where I set an outcome goal instead of an output goal. And if nobody did that, I would have been really frustrated. So every day my experience would be, why didn't Josh share my thing today? He doesn't even know I exist, but he should still be sharing it in his newsletter because it's really good. And the difference in the ability to create and show up every day is night and day. And the opportunities that came about it, I think are more plentiful because People can tell when you're focused on yeah. outcome instead of output. And when you're focused on output, you're focused on contribution, on providing and creating that value we talked about earlier on. And that's what resonates with people, not that you're trying to achieve some big follower metric goal or something like that. So I also think the other the other piece of this is especially when you create sort of evergreen content that isn't time sensitive. You see this especially with blog posts, but I bet ultimately it's going to be true with your book as well, right? That you don't actually know how much value you got out of a thing in the first day, three months. But people look at stuff and they go, oh that was a failure, right? So I have blog posts that I might have published five years ago that are still getting me new clients. If I would have looked at that blog post in the first week, two weeks, month, whatever, getting me clients, getting me subscribers, getting me everything, right? My concept of how quote unquote valuable that post was and whether it worked or not would be a tiny fraction of how valuable it has ultimately become, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other, and this is true of everything. It's true of tweets. It's true of blog posts. It's true of books. It's true of everything that is relatively timeless, right? Um, you know, and even in little ways, right? Like I have people that sign up for my newsletter, reach out to me on Twitter, maybe ask me a very specific question about something. And I happen to have written a blog post four years about. And I'm able to answer them and go, hey, go read this, right? The value, people tend to think of value only as like transactional, right? But that value of me being able to just copy and, you know, cut and paste the link to send them to a well thought out, well written answer to their specific question, which maybe makes them want to hire me or maybe makes them want to tell other people or share the post. Like there's so much unseen value initially that you can't anticipate. Um, when and what mm -hmm. it, it ultimately may become, which is another reason why focusing on outcome goals is a mistake because your outcome based on what window, right? The, the, the blog post that got 200 views five years ago, but then I could share today and get 2000 more. Who knows? I didn't, you know, and who knows, who knows what my audience is 10 years from now? Like it's the value compounds. And that's why it's just, it's a fool's errand to try to like judge you the success of your stuff based on its outcome. Yeah. hundred percent. I've just experienced this last week in my community, which 
I didn't realize I was going to create a community when I launched my book, but here we are. And someone asked a question and I grabbed the link to the chapter in the book. And I said, Hey, I wrote about it here. You probably just haven't got to that chapter in the book. Yet. He's like, Oh yeah, that's so cool that your answer's in the book. And it was just this virtuous circle of, wow, I wrote about that eight months, 10 months ago. And now it's directly serving someone who had a specific question. I had it thought out. It was 1500 words and it was better than any little short comment I could have given him, you know, in a paragraph or two. So you're creating value for yourself that will compound over time because yeah, you might start with five or 10 or 30 blog posts, but look at what happens when you have a, uh, an entire library of 300 that you can pull from at any moment and share with people. That's huge. So funny. And I gotta say, I'm so glad that when we talked about content strategy and we talked about mindset, we didn't talk about using this code or using this color or use this tactic or whatever. The thing I probably have tweeted the most in a decade or more of being on Twitter is success is 80% strategy, yeah. sorry, 80% mindset and only 20% strategy and skills. So it's the most important thing, the way you approach your work. This idea of output versus outcome is so much more important than whether you're on Substack or ConvertKit or Ghost or whatever. Yeah. Well, um, it's funny. Yeah, I love <laughs> that you said the, I love that you said the word library because the other thing that I tell people a lot is, you know, and this is also mindset, right? You're not creating content. You're building a content library. That's different, right? People, when people think, oh, mm -hmm. I'm just creating content as if it's this sort of individual thing floating over here and this worked and, or didn't work or whatever, I'm creating content, time to create more content. It's like, no, you're building a library. And, you know, you know this, obviously, from working in the entertainment industry and, you know, my background in the entertainment industry, I think, influences this, uh, this idea as well. The true value in the entertainment industry is in the libraries that these studios and everyone have created, right? The Office, Seinfeld, they made way more money in syndication and all that stuff and the value of the library than they did the sort of Thursday night that Seinfeld happened to air right? From the ads on that show. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is content creators online, I don't think most think that way. They don't think I'm building a library that ultimately has, you know, significantly more value. They think they're looking and judging a piece of content as if Seinfeld was judging how much do we make on ads from the first time it ran. Right. right? And it's a, it's a very... Every five years, it renews at, what, $100 million every time, yeah, you know? It's, you know, it's a very... They weren't making that Thursday night. And that library value plays out in all sorts of different ways. But the And I don't know this for a fact. I'm guessing a bit, but I'm pretty sure. My guess is most people who have hired me or bought my products did not read one blog post or one newsletter and then do so, right? It's the, the, the breadth of the library. You know, when I, when they, when people ask me questions, I almost always will send them multiple posts because I know if they read three posts that they find helpful, the strength of that relationship, that connection, their perception of me and the value, if they read three super valuable free blog posts, they're going to wonder what they're going to learn in a, paid skill session workshop or a consulting call or whatever, right? Whereas if I send them one, they might go, oh, that was really great. And maybe they'll go surf around and look at other stuff. But there's a value in that sort of breadth, which again, is why output is so important because you want the more, you know, every, every piece of content, and I think about this all the way down to an individual tweet level, every piece of content is like a stock you buy. And the only cost is the time it takes you to create it. And like all stocks, not all of them, but many of them will increase in value over time. So that act of content creation is like, I really do think about it like, oh, here's another stock I bought with the hour it took me to write it. Or in the case of tweets, the five minutes it took me to tweet it. Wow. I, I feel like we're going to need to do a round two at some point <laughs> to talk about growth and scaling and all that, because we've just 
we did it, man. We we're almost at the hour. Oh. So we've got a few people in the audience. If you're here listening, first of all, thank you. This is amazing. Um, I switched over from Twitter spaces over to Riverside and they do have a live feature, which is exciting. Um, Twitter spaces just wasn't up to snuff when it comes to like full video podcast production. So I made the switch, but it's exciting that people are here. If you have any questions, we'd love to ask them or answer them in the next you know few minutes we have left. There's even a feature, I think if you're on your computer on Chrome, you can tap a button that says start live call and you can actually ask your question live, which we would love to answer live. Um, so I'll give that a minute or so as we kind of start wrapping up because I wanna be respectful of your time as well. Um, maybe this will be a fun one. See if we could do 30 second answers on this part and then that'll prompt a, or set us up for a, a round two uh, down the line. But if it comes down to one piece of advice that you could share with people when it comes to, they've kind of been, they've been doing it for a year, they've got a thousand or 2000 mm -hmm. subscribers, and now they want to turn it into a business. They want to get to 10 or 20. What's the, what's the one thing that comes to mind or that you're constantly sharing with people in that scenario? One thing, uh, well, <laughs> I guess the first thing I would say is you probably don't need to get to 10 or 20. I think people tend to think that they need a much, it's funny, I tweeted this the other day. Let me see if I can remember how I, how I phrased it or if I botched my own quote. Um, people overestimate the number, how big an audience they need to succeed. And they underestimate what's possible with a smaller audience right so i think the first assumption a lot of people have like just using your example right if you have a thousand people who fit your target audience who want the transformation that you can help them make you can make a lot of money i mean it depends on what you do right what you're what you offer and what your services and product and whatever right but i think there's an assumption everyone assumes they need a much bigger audience than they do uh, to succeed. So depending what the person was doing, I think that's where I would start. You know, I would sort of go, I'll give you, I'll give you another, uh, sort of hypothetical example. Uh, you know, talking to a comedian, comedians are always, I need more followers. It's always like, I need a bigger audience. I need more followers. I say, okay, like, well, let's start with like, what do you, again, going back to the questions I referenced in the beginning, right? What are you actually trying to accomplish? Like, don't let's not talk about social media because just like newsletters, social media is a tactic to achieve a goal. It's not a goal itself, right? So, what are you trying to do? What's the goal? And the person said, "Oh, I'd love to be cast on a sitcom." And I was like, "Perfect, okay." What do you think is going to get you closer to getting cast on a sitcom? Fifty thousand random people following you, or five hundred casting directors and showrunners? Obviously, it's casting directors and showrunners. You don't need to know. How to that would be like everybody in the industry. You too. don't need like, to there's know. Not, how to there aren't even 10,000 casting directors, right. you know? So, yeah, let's even say it was 50, right? You can even go smaller. But I said, so really, <laughs> we should talk about a strategy for how you're going to use social media to get casting directors and showrunners to follow you and be aware of you. Because that's going to get you to your goal faster than random people following you, right? So, in your example, Again, there may be, depending what they do, maybe they do need more followers. But in most cases, they probably don't need as many as they think they do, right? So I would start mm -hmm. with that. And I would start with, again, it all depends on kind of what are they selling? What are they trying to do? But let's figure out how we're going to do that, right? And then along with that, if some of that does involve and require sort of growing your audience, you know, there are certainly things you can do to do that. But I think most people have this. And, look, here, and here's another good example, right? Like I have 18,000 subscribers to my newsletter. I've been at that number for a while, right? I grow, I add a bunch, but I email people daily. Like, you know, it, the bigger you get, the mm -hmm. tougher it is to grow. Would I like to have more? Yes. Is it going to massively change my business? Not really. Like it will go, it will go up some, but certainly on the consulting side, you know, product sales side, it probably would help on the consulting side. I can only work with so many people anyway. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm not all that, you know, Twitter is another good example, right? I love that I have 22,000 followers or whatever. Um, when I had 10,000 or 15,000, yeah, I get more engagement now. Yeah, my audience is bigger. It's not life changing. The difference between, you know, 10,000 and 20,000 followers to my business has not been all that much, really. I'm not saying like, you know, would I like to go from 20 to 40 or 50? Yeah, sure. Of course, of course I would. Like, and do I do things to try to grow and grow my newsletter? Yes, I do. Like, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But I don't have the assumption that I need to get to that point not only to grow my business, but to, you know, like my revenue has steadily grown, even when my newsletter has stayed about the same, I've gotten better at learning how to sell stuff. I've gotten better at creating products. Like there's a lot of stuff you can optimize, um, with an existing audience. It's not just more, more, more. Yeah. When it goes back to the mindset thing of, if you believe that you have to wait until some huge milestone in order to make money, then that's how you're going to operate your business. Whereas if you think, how can I create value for one person today and go create value for them and try to turn them into a customer, you can have a thriving business with five customers, depending on what your product or what your offer is. And so I'm a living example of this. I have what, almost 1800 followers on Twitter, which is the platform I'm trying to grow on and create awareness on. And I just crossed 2000 subscribers on my email list. And last month, Craftsman Creative did $20,000 in revenue. Yeah. So do I need 20,000 followers to make $20,000? No, mm -hmm. I'm doing that with one-tenth of the audience. And so I, I, it goes back to that saying, like, success is 80% mindset. And if you think, like we've talked about in this conversation about providing value first, you can start making money like tomorrow. You could literally record something tonight for 30 minutes that solves a very specific singular problem for someone in your audience, throw it on Gumroad and charge 20 bucks for it and start making money. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I just read a report that um, the Tilt did. They pulled like five or 8,000 creators and the average time it was taking people to make like a significant living was like 18 months or something mm -hmm. like that. And I'm sitting here going... I don't want to wait that long. I want to start making money now. Like you could be making a thousand plus a month very quickly if you've gone through the process of like identifying who it's for and what your goal right. is that's, and focus on output. Key, right. The whole key is it's, it's, it's again, the sort of foundational stuff. If you are not strategic about what you're doing, it's not going to work. And, you know, and the, the generic piece is such a trap and you see so much of it. Uh, you know, this is actually, and this is, I guess, sort of content strategy advice, but like you see, you see this on Twitter all the time, right? There's so many generic tweets, right? And very much like the newsletter, like get more specific. My advice to almost everyone on Twitter is like, whatever it is that you want to tweet, get more specific, more actionable, and like, think about what's, what can someone do after they read this tweet other than just like, you know, the sort of generic motivational stuff. Um, and you see it all, you see it all the time. Right. And, and I'll give people this feedback sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll be like, Oh, I don't, why didn't this thread or why didn't this tweet do better? And I'm like, it's not specific enough, you know, telling people have a, productive morning it doesn't matter if it's true or not right like tell them how to have a productive morning or tell them how you have like just get way more specific and it will it will almost always do better nice i think that's a good place to to wrap up i don't see any questions come through so thank you to the audience that was here um this will go live in uh about two weeks cool. in the newsletter and be on the podcast and at some point, I'll create the YouTube channel and have all these videos on there as well. Um, Josh, where can people find you online and what do you want to point them to? And do you have any last like asks or requests sure. or um, anything like that of the audience? Uh, first thing is get my newsletter at fortheinterested.com slash subscribe. Uh, they can go to joshspector.com to learn more about who I am and what I do and read my blog posts and 
Uh, if they're interested in hiring me for some consulting help, uh, there's details there as well. Uh, my skill sessions, if they want to check that out, joshspector.com slash sessions. Um, and then obviously I'm active on Twitter at jspector, J-S-P-E-C-T-O-R. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, uh, just sort of an overall takeaway, like not enough people do things. They talk about doing things. They think about doing things. They ask how to do things, but they don't actually do them. Right. So, so my advice is just go start doing things and you'll figure out the rest. It doesn't matter if it works at first or not. But if you're the kind of person that is consistently doing things, you will get places, right? If you're the kind of person that's forever learning and waiting and figuring out, oh, I'm going to, you know, like, it's just, it's just not going to happen. You know, I tweeted, I think last night, uh, which is actually sort of a new idea for me, but I, I said, if you spent uh, one hour a day writing, one hour a day learning, and one hour a day selling every day, I find it impossible to believe you would not become successful. Wouldn't happen overnight. But if you just did that and did nothing else, you'd figure it out and ultimately probably do pretty well. That would be a good summary of the last 10 months of my life. Yeah, see, <laughs> see, there you go. Uh, amazing. Well, this has been a joy for me. Um, well, I hope we can do this again another yeah. time because um, I'm sure there's plenty of things we could talk about together. Um, thanks for your time, taking the time and being available and, uh, please go check him out. He's one of my favorite follows and it's one of the maybe five newsletters that I allow into my inbox on a regular basis and that I actually read every day. And so it's great. It also is a, uh, a massive, like you, you're getting that Oprah effect to start happening where you can drive, you know, I think when you posted uh, a link to my stuff, it was like 1,250 people came to my site in two days, yeah, which I can't do that in a week on been, my own. That's been like, it's, in, you know, it's interesting. You talk about audience growth. Mm -hmm. The the thing that's been the most fun is to now start to get to a point. It, it's interesting. I get more excited by, oh, how many people did I send? I probably even followed up with you. How many subscribers did you get? Like I get more excited by being able to sort of shine a light on other stuff that I, you know, people that I think are doing it right and doing cool stuff, um, almost more so than I do my own like sales and stuff. So if you ask me like what actually, if my audience would double, I think where my mind first would go is, wow, I could really drive traffic now, right? Traffic. Yeah. And that to me, even more so than like, yeah, I would get more product sales and whatever, but that's been, <clears throat> and that's probably in some ways, as my audience has grown, you know, one, cause again, like with clients, I can only work with so many anyway. Right. But to be able mm -hmm. to put a link in my newsletter and send a thousand plus people to something is really cool and really fun. And, you know, uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I it, it is one yeah. of, it's been one of the most fun things about having my audience get to a certain point. That's a huge amount of value that you provide to people. And I started implementing it myself in my newsletter where now I have a whole section of every week, I'm going to po post a different newsletter that creators should go check out for the same reason, mainly because like the fact that you're getting 10 or 14% click rates and I'm getting less than two, <laughs> it's oh, like, yeah. oh, I got the other thing. And I completely stumbled into this, <laughs> but my weekday issues because they, for people that don't know, my weekday issues, are, mm -hmm. it's basically a one paragraph newsletter, sometimes only a sentence. And it's literally like a sentence and a link and then a one sentence ad sponsor thing. Uh, the clicks and the engagement on that compared to my Sunday, which is a longer newsletter, I will get more clicks on the one link in a weekday issue than I will all the links combined in the Sunday issue. So... Again, I've completely yeah. sort of stumbled into it, but that's the other thing that I realize that has really been fun is like, wow, like this is, you know, so like, yeah, to get like that high percentage click, you're like, I won't get that in my Sunday, right? It, it's very much <laughs> format oriented, um, which again, was not a master plan, but it has become this really cool asset that 
that works incredibly well, at least in terms of driving traffic and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, awesome. it's not, I was going to say, it's not you. It's, and I, it's not you and it's not me. It's the, it's the format. <laughs> hey, every once in a while, you know, we're blessed with a little bit of grace uh, along our journey to pursuing all of these crazy, awesome, creative goals we have. So you got to account for some of that too. Cool. All right, man. Well, thank you a ton. And uh, we'll be in touch. I'm sure. <laughs> See, See you online. <laughs>